David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you for your blessings of this day. Uh, thank you for the word of God that we can read. Thank you for the Holy Ghost that can teach us and guide us. I pray that you might help us now as we go throughout this time together. In Jesus' name we prayed. Amen and amen. You know, if there's something that you know uh, as you read scriptures about God, is that God is a God of order. And we took a whole message a few weeks ago to talk about that. He says here in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God. The sixth month, meaning the sixth month from the time that Elizabeth had conceived. If you go back to the, the first part of this chapter, you will see there that the angel Gabriel appeared to Zacharias in the temple. And the angel told him that Elizabeth, the one that was bearing, and she was very old by this time, she was going to conceive a child, and that child's name was going to be John. And he was going to be the forerunner of Jesus Christ himself. You see, God is never one moment too late or one moment too soon. And, and to us, that's, that's hard to comprehend. And sometimes we as humans, we become impatient with God. But let me just remind you that the Bible uh, speaks clearly. Let, let's go to the book of Galatians. Hold your place here for a moment. But let's go to the book of Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. The Bible says this. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son. Jesus Christ was right on schedule. Uh, if you remember, as, as we studied the life of Christ in the, Old, in the New Testament, at various times, the Pharisees and others would seek to trap Jesus and to get rid of him. And the Bible was said, the hour had not yet come for him to be crucified. So he would escape and he would just get, get by and, and, and go other places. But, but the time eventually came that it was time for him to give his life. And he, and he spoke to his disciples about that time. So, so throughout the scriptures, we see that God is right on schedule. On the sixth month of the, uh, of the time of Elizabeth that she had conceived, God sent Gabriel to meet with another person. And this time, he was meeting with this person called Mary that we saw portray on this clip just a few moments ago. Mary. You know, if I was, if I was God myself, <laughs> and I'm not, but to me, it would have made more sense for the wife of Zacharias to be the one that bears the Christ than for Mary. For one thing, the wife of Zacharias was older. And you will assume that an older person is typically wiser. And, you know, they have more discernment and so forth. But no, God chose what most people believe was a teenager. Somewhere between the age of 15 and 19, most likely, is when Mary was received this news from Gabriel. And that, and that sort of confounds my mind because, again, when we think of youth, we think of inexperience. We think of lack of wisdom at times. But as you study the scriptures, you'll see that God, in many different occasions, he used young people to accomplish his will. And I always tell young people, do not use your age as an excuse not to serve God. You hear that? Do not use your age as an excuse not to serve God. God can use anyone at any time. 
Just think about that donkey that met Balaam on the way and how God made that donkey to speak. If God can use a donkey, he surely can use you and me. Think about Joseph. The Bible says that he was 17 years old when he was sold by his brothers into slavery. And the Bible says that God was with Joseph. And he accomplished great and mighty things. Think about Daniel. Daniel most likely was also a teenager, you know, somewhere between late teen, early 20s. He was, he was, cap, he was uh, captive of the Babylonians, taken to that place. And there, the Bible says that, that he found favor in the sight of God. And once again, Daniel, Daniel was greatly used of God. Well, here we come to Mary, most likely a teenager, very young person. And yet, somehow, she caught the attention of God. Now, let me tell you something about Mary. Mary was not a wealthy person. She was not. To the contrary, she was a poor person. So how do you know that? Well, when they, were, when, when they went to the temple to offer a sacrifice, uh, when they were, they were uh, bringing Jesus to the temple, uh, when he was eight days old, they made a sacrifice, and the sacrifice that they made was a two turtle doves. And those were sacrifices that poor people would make because they could not afford to offer a lamb. So instead of offering a lamb, they offered these two turtle doves. That tells us of the financial condition of Mary and Joseph. They were not wealthy people. Now, Mary was not from a royalty. She must say she did not have blue blood running through her veins. She was not a royal. She was, if anything, she was a peasant of the lowest of the lowest in society. And again, you know, as a human person, you would think that God will choose the, the wealthy, the well-connected, uh, to accomplish this great task of bringing his son into the world. And it confounds us humans that he chose not to do that. But you see, God looks at life in a very different way than we look at life as humans. You see, we humans are greatly influenced by the outside appearance of man, where those things do not impress God. You see, our wealth does not impress God. Our status in society does not impress God. So what impresses God? What is it that God is looking for in a person? You know, God looks deep inside our heart. He looks deep down inside our heart. What is your heart condition towards him? Are you willing to submit to God? Are you willing to follow his guidance and direction in your life, whatever it may be? And sadly, most of us are not willing to do that. Most of us are not willing to yield to God and submit to his leading. Consequently, we sort of, in a way, we sort of limit God's workings in our lives. Because if God is going to do a great work through us, he's going to have to take from us that yielding and submission that is so very important to God. But look here, verse number 28 says, And the angel came in unto her, and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored. She was highly favored of God. 
And again, she was a teenager, poor, and a peasant. So in a way, she has sort of three strikes against her. But again, that is not the way that God looks at us. God was looking deep down into her heart. And the Bible says, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. God was with Mary. Now let me, let me just stop here for a moment. Mary was not the mother of God. Like our Catholic friends want to think. Mary was not the mother of God. God has always been. We have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three of them were spirits in the beginning. And what we are seeing here taking place is that God the Son is going to take on human form, and God is going to use Mary as a vessel to bring that to pass. You see, Jesus Christ was going to offer up himself as the perfect sacrifice for you and for me. But in order to do that, he had to have a body. He had to have a, a body. And he did not in his, in his eternal being. He was a spirit. So he was going to use Mary as a vessel to take on human flesh. When Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost in the womb of Mary, that was not the beginning of Jesus. Jesus has always been. He's the creator of the universe. If you go to the book of Colossians, you will see that very clearly. So here we see that Mary, she's not sinless either. Mary was a sinful person just like you and I are sinful people. But again, God, in his sovereign wisdom, God uses sinful people to accomplish his will. Otherwise, he couldn't use any of us. <laughs> because all of us had the stain of sin in our lives. All of us do. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So how it is that God chooses to use some people that are sinful, and he chooses not to use other people that are sinful. And I believe that the answer is, first of all, you need to have a relationship with God. And that comes deep down back to our heart. Are we willing to acknowledge God for who he is? We spoke about this last week. A big problem that we have today in our society is that people do not want to acknowledge God as sovereign. When they knew God, by looking at nature itself, when they knew that there was a God, they chose not to glorify him as God and were, and were not thankful. Remember that from last week? That's a problem that we have today in our society. Many people are not honoring God. Well, if you're, going, if you're going to have a relationship with God, the first step is to acknowledge him. Acknowledge that he's sovereign, that he rules over everything. We have to come with that humble heart. Think about David, King David. You know, God anointed him to be king over the nation of Israel. And of course, in one instance, he committed this great, I mean, a series of sins. First of all, he looked upon this woman. He lost her after her. Then she sent for her. He committed adultery with her. Then to cover up his sin, he killed her husband. I mean, one sin leads to another, and another, and another. You know what happens when we come, when we sin against God? What we need to do as human people is to acknowledge our sin. That's the first step. When we sin against God, we have to acknowledge that we have sinned against him. And then we have to ask him to forgive us. You know, the Bible says that a contrite heart, a humble and a contrite heart, God is not going to reject. The problem is that we as humans have a hard time, again, acknowledging God as sovereign. 
And we don't want to place ourselves under his guidance and protection. We want to run life our own way. Isn't that the problem that we have in our society today? Many people, they want to live life their own way, according to their eyes, according to their intellect. And when we go about living life in that way, we're drifting away from God. Not so with Mary. You know, Mary was somebody that the Bible says was highly favored. The Bible says that God was with her. She had a special relationship with God Almighty. And you know what? That is not something that is a, a mystery. All of us can have a special relationship with God. All of us can. The problem is that we are not willing to pay the price that it takes. You see, if you're going to have a special relationship with God, it's going to require a lot out of you. It's going to require a lot out of me. It's going to require a lot of self-denial. You hear that? It's going to require a lot of self-denial. We're going to have to learn to deny ourselves in order to promote God. Think about John the Baptist. When John the Baptist, uh, at one point, uh, his, his disciples were a little bit uh, disoriented. They, they, you know, they were confused about, about the role of John the Baptist and the role of Christ. And John the Baptist said, and he spoke out and said, it is needful for me to decrease and for him to increase. You see, John the Baptist understood this concept. But what happens with us sometimes? We as humans, sometimes, we do a lot of things trying to self-promote ourselves. We want to self promote ourselves. And that is not really what God wants us to do. God wants us to promote him. To promote him. To put him on the pedestal. To honor him. To glorify him. To thank him. And so on. But we don't want to do that. Because we want to live life our own way. Well, praise God, some people through the ages and even today have chosen that instead of living a life of self-promotion, they're going to live a life that promotes God instead. And so it was with Mary. She was somebody that was not about herself, but she wanted to honor God with her life, and God took notice of that on her or in her. It says, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. I would be confused too if I heard those things coming from somebody. She was confused. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. What a, what a blessing. She, this young teenager, this young teenager, she had not accomplished great and mighty things. She had not built an empire. She was a lowly person. Here in this video clip that we watched just now, she went to the well to get some water. That was a menial task, very lowly. And yet, she found favor with God. And once again, I want to stress this point today because it's very important for us to understand this. God looks at us in a different way that we look at each other. We try to impress other people by the things that we do, the accomplishments that we have accomplished, the education that we have acquired, our position in, our, in the company, 
how much money we make, what, how big of a house do we have, how new of a car do we drive. And we're trying to impress other people by these outside things that don't mean anything to God. And then we wonder, how is it that we live such a shallow life? How, how is it that God is not, how is it that God's power is not displayed in my life? Because we let ourselves get caught up in the way the world thinks, the way the world operates. You see, we're, we're letting ourselves get caught up on that whole way of thinking, and God is in a different orbit altogether. <laughs> you know, the world's system is over here. That's the way they operate. God is over here in a whole different orbit, in a whole different realm. And when we choose to live life like a simple human being, we're losing connection with God. Do you see that? Many people today are choosing to live over here. No wonder they don't have any power. No wonder God is not choosing them to do great and mighty things. No wonder sometimes they're miserable and wretched. Is it possible for a Christian to live in this realm? Of course it is. And sadly, many Christians today are choosing to live life in this realm. Just like everybody else is living life. Instead of living life in this realm over here, which is a whole different way of looking at life. And then we see why is it that our churches that our churches are dying? Where are the people? Our churches used to be filled in years past. What is happening? What's happening is that even believers today are not, are not, do not experience the power of God in their lives. They're shallow. They're shallow and weak, and God cannot use people like that. You see, and we are not willing to pay the price of self-denial to get life on this other realm, where God is blessing, where God wants to accomplish great and mighty things. And we're choosing, and we're choosing badly. You know, the world way of life, the world's way of thinking is very contrary to God's way of thinking. Hold your place here for a moment. Let's go to the book of James. Let's go to James for a moment. James chapter 4. James chapter 4 in the New Testament. James chapter 4, let's begin with verse number 1. It says, From whence come wars, war, wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust, the war in your members? Ye lost and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask, and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. You see, and that's the way, I'm afraid, that's the place where many believers find themselves in today. They're living lives to fulfill their own lusts and desires. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You know what that is telling me there, my friends? What that tells me there is that God expects us to be separate people. God expects us to what he refers to as to be holy people. He wants us to be separate. He wants us to think differently than the world thinks. He wants us to speak differently than the world speaks. He wants us to behave differently. He wants us to dress differently. He wants us to react differently. 
He wants us to live life in a different way. Mary was such a person. Mary was living life not for herself. Mary was living life to exalt God Almighty. And that caught the eye and attention of God. God does not look at our experience. God does not look at our wealth. God does not look at our accomplishments. That doesn't matter to God. It doesn't matter to God, all those things, like it matters to us. What God is impressed with, if I may use that term, what God is impressed with is our heart attitude towards him. Are we living life to honor and to please him? Or are we living life like everybody else to please ourselves? You see, when we choose to live life in this realm, the Bible says, that we just read it, that those people that choose to live life in this realm are the enemies of God. And believers find themselves living life like that. God cannot bless those people. Well, Mary was a different kind of person. She was not perfect. She was not sinless. But what set her apart is that she desired to honor God with her life. That's what made her different. And that's what I believe caught the eye of God. Verse 30 says, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. God chose her as the vessel through which Jesus Christ himself will take on human form, be born into this world, and eventually give up his life to save us from our sins. The name Jesus means Savior. Verse 32 says, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. God made a covenant with David that through him the Messiah will come. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And let me t tell you right now that one day Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth. He's going to touch down on the Mount of Olives. He's going to destroy the enemies of Israel. And he's going to set up his throne in the city of Jerusalem. And the Bible says he's going to reign there for a thousand years. God keeps his promises. So he made this covenant with God. And here we're seeing the fulfillment of it. Verse 33 says, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be seen? I know not a man. You know, that was a very good question. She said, How, how can this happen? I have not had sexual relationships with anyone. How can I have a child? She was a virgin. Nothing wrong with sexual relationships in the confines of holy matrimony. You see, God created that. God created us to be sexual people. The problem today is that we as humans are perverting God's plan for that type of relationship. You see, and she asked the question, how can this be seen? I have not had that type of relationship that is required to have a child. How can I have a child? Was that a good question to ask? Of course it was. She said, how can this be? And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Jesus Christ had no father, no human father. Jesus Christ 
was conceived by the Holy Ghost himself. You see, if Jesus had had a human father, he would have been stained by sin. Because sin gets passed on by the fathers. You see, all of us are descendants from Adam. We have, we have the curse of sin in us. But not so with Christ. Christ did not have a human father. His father was the Holy Ghost, if you might call it that. I mean, you know, it, it, it's just sometimes, you know, it's hard to understand. Like I told you, Jesus Christ has always been, right? When he was conceived by Mary, that was not the beginning of Jesus. What was happening was that he was taking on human form. And the Holy Ghost was the one that performed that work in her womb. The Holy Ghost came upon her, and that's how she conceived. Now, verse number 33 says, number 36 says, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. And then he says this, For God, or for with God, nothing shall be impossible. You see, God is the one that set in motion the natures of law. God was the one that established the law of gravity. God was the one that established the law of thermodynamics. God is the one that established all the laws of the universe that we see. He's the one that set those laws into, or into being. He set boundaries to the oceans. The oceans cannot come whatever they please. Now, God set boundaries for them. God set an orbits for the planets, and they stay on those orbits. You know what? Whenever God wants to change the rules, he can. God can change the rules whenever he pleases. We see that when the children of Israel were leaving Egypt, and they were trapped between the sea and the Egyptians, and God told Moses, Moses, lift up your, your staff, and he did, and lo and behold, the sea parted in two. Not only that, but the ground was dry instead of muddy. And he told Moses, Moses, tell the children of Israel to cross the Red Sea to the other side. You see, when the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River and they came upon the city of Jericho, that great and mighty fortress, God told them, I want you to walk around it one time a day. And the seventh day, I want you to walk around it seven times. And then I want you to blow the trumpets. And they did. You know what happened when they blew the trumpets on that seventh day? The walls of Jericho came tumbling down. You say, how can that be? Well, you know what the Bible says? That Jesus Christ is the one thing that holds things together. It's about the power of God that all these things are, are held together. All these atoms and particles and molecules, they're all held together by the power of God. And if God chooses to let them loose, they're going to come loose. And there's nothing that you and I can do to stop it. You see, we call those things miracles because they do not follow the normal rules that we come to expect in life. God is not bound by the rules of nature like we are. He is the one that set the rules into place. And he can change them whenever he pleases. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. But then look at verse number 38. And this is the thing, once again, that sets Mary apart from a lot of people. Her life was being turned upside down. Everything that she had dreamed about, everything that she was expecting life would be like, all of a sudden it was changed. Up, I mean, everything was changed completely. Just think about it. She was going to be having a child. What will the general public think happen? The general public would think that she was committing 
fornication or adultery, whatever you want to call it. You see, people will have a bad view of her. And, and you see, sometimes God will call us to do things that are very hard for us to even imagine having the ability to carry out. How, can I, how will I be able to make it and do this great thing that God is calling me to do? And sometimes we let those things overwhelm us and we get paralyzed and we don't do anything. It's just too great. It's, it's just, there's no way that I can do what you're asking me to do. And that's true. There's no way that we as humans can do the things that God is asking us to do. It's going to take the power of God working through us to make those things happen. You see, we have limitations as humans. We do. We're limited. But God is supreme. God is sovereign. There's nothing that God cannot do. If we will simply acknowledge him and yield ourselves to him, and that's what Mary learned to do from a very early age. Verse 38 says, And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. She saw herself as a servant of God. God, I am your servant. Use me as you see, please. Or as you see fit. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it, be it unto me according to thy word. That is precisely the type of attitude that God wants us to have towards him. God, here I am. Use me. Use me. I want to surrender myself to you. What is it that you want me to do? You see, and we may be surprised by the things that God may wants us to do because they may not align with the things that we are wanting to do. You see, we may be wanting to go this way, and God says, no, I have a different way that I want you to go. And unless we have this attitude of yieldingness and submission in our lives, we are not going to go that way. We're going to continue going this way. Mary, teenager, poor, a peasant. You might say uneducated in a way. And yet, she was highly regarded by the master of the universe. Don't let your limitations and shortcomings keep you from serving God. God can overpower those things. God can overpower those things. So we like to make excuses why we cannot serve God. God is greater than our excuses. God is greater than the limitations that we have. Simply surrender yourself to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. That you're willing to use us, sinful people. We're, we're grateful, God, that 